When I was 28 years old, I went to Antarctica. At this point in my life, I was pretending to be a research biologist. I was hoping that I could keep pretending long enough to finish a dissertation on a subject I found moderately interesting in principle and mind-numbingly dull in the details. <laughs> Antarctica taught me a lot about passion. Most of the scientists I was in Antarctica with were passionate about their research. It was what got them up in the morning. It was what kept them in the lab late at night. And I was not passionate <laughs> about the research. But there were a lot of other things to be passionate about in Antarctica. There were glaciers. There were penguins. There was history. There was fascinating, passionate people. And I was passionate about the midnight sunlit hikes and the long lunchtime conversations. And then the director of the science program took me aside. He said, Claire, you are here to be doing science. Time not spent doing science is wasted time. And I thought, I cannot fake it anymore. <laughs> I owe it to myself to follow my passions. And my passions took me to teaching. I'm a biology teacher. It is my responsibility, also my great joy, to teach students about the connections among living things. And one of the most fundamental connections Help. <laughs> oh, there we go. One of the most fundamental connections among living things is this, this connection between photosynthesis and cellular respiration. It's one of my favorite subjects to teach. So plants take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They use the energy of the sun, and they convert that carbon dioxide into sugars. This process is called photosynthesis. It produces oxygen as a waste product, and this process is the fundamental source of sugars on Earth. Now, plants can take those sugars and convert them into starches and proteins. And then animals come and eat the plants. They use their digestive system to break the starches and proteins back into sugars. And then they burn some of those sugars for energy. That burning is called cellular respiration. It requires oxygen. It produces energy for the animal. And it produces, as its waste product, carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide then becomes available for a plant to use again in this grand cycle of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. So every night when I feed hay to my goats, or every morning when parents all over the world are getting breakfast for their children, we're participating in this grand cycle of photosynthesis and cellular respiration, of carbon and energy cycling between organisms. But one of the things that fascinates me is the way that if we care enough, if we're passionate enough to look more closely, we see there are many hidden links in this giant connection between photosynthesis and cell respiration. And many of the hidden links, a surprising number of the hidden links, involve microorganisms. So, for example, even a very, very simple map of the Earth shows us that most of the surface of the Earth is water. And there are very few plants in the water. So what's doing the photosynthesis in the three-fifths of the Earth's surface that's covered in ocean? It's not plants. It's microorganisms. It's algae and cyanobacteria. Collectively, we call them phytoplankton. They're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. They're using the energy of the sun to convert that carbon dioxide into sugars and starches and proteins. They're forming the base of the aquatic food chain. And little tiny animals called zooplankton are eating this phytoplankton. And little fish are eating the zooplankton. And bigger fish are eating the little fish. And this whole cycle of life in the oceans is based on photosynthesis, but not by plants. It's photosynthesis by microorganisms. Even back on land, where it is mostly plants doing the photosynthesis, but even back on land, 
the microbes turn out to have a surprisingly important role. And that's because when plants link sugars together, they don't only make starches and proteins. They also make this molecule. This is cellulose. And cellulose, it's like starch in that it's a bunch of sugars linked together. But it's different in the way they're connected. So this is called a beta link, and it's very difficult for organisms to break down. Most organisms on Earth cannot break it down. And almost all the organisms that can break it down are microorganisms. So my goats eating hay, sure, some of the sugars in there are in starches that they can use, but most of the sugars in the leaves or in the hay is in this form of cellulose. And the goats can't break it down. The goats have gotten around this by developing a partnership with microorganisms. So goats have a specialized stomach called a rumen. It's a specialized chamber in their stomach. And it's full of bacteria, millions of bacteria. And some of those bacteria can break down cellulose, break it down into the sugars. And then the bacteria start to do cellular respiration to get energy, not for the goat, for the bacteria. But remember that cellular respiration requires oxygen. There is not very much oxygen in the stomach of a goat. And so those bacteria can't do aerobic cellular respiration. They have to get by on a less efficient process. They have to get by on fermentation. It produces a little bit of energy. But most of the energy that was in the sugars is now in these waste products, these end products, lactic acid, ethanol, other molecules. And these molecules are then available as a source of energy for the goat. So the goat also breaks down and absorbs some of the bacteria, but the major thing that a goat is getting its nutrition from when it's eating plant material like willow leaves or hay, the major thing it's, getting, it's using for energy are these waste products from the bacteria that were living in its, in its stomach. So why is it that the goat can use these waste products when the bacteria couldn't? It's because the goat is a complex multicellular organism. The goat has lungs to extract oxygen from the atmosphere. The goat has a heart to pump that oxygen throughout its body to deliver oxygen to all the cells of the goat so that it has the oxygen it needs to finish cellular respiration, to convert those sugars into energy and into carbon dioxide. And so we're seeing how important the role of these microorganisms is in the cell cellular respiration half of that giant cycle between photosynthesis and cell respiration. But what about us? Do we eat cellulose? Do we have bacteria in our digestive tracts? Yes, yes to both of them. We eat cellulose, go back please, thank you. We eat cellulose, it's, we call it dietary fiber. Nutritionists are always trying to get us to eat more of it. And we have bacteria, but not so much in our stomachs. Most of our bacteria are in our large intestine. So when we eat cellulose, dietary fiber, it passes basically undigested through the top parts of our digestive tract. It provides bulk. It keeps things moving along efficiently. It keeps us from getting constipated. And then it gets to the large intestine where all our bacteria are. And when it gets to the large intestine, some of that cellulose gets broken down by those bacteria. We get a few vitamins from that process. We get a few gases from that process. It can lead to flatulence. But it's clear that the cellulose and the bacteria are nowhere near as important for our nutrition as they were for the goat's nutrition. However, recent research has shown that the bacteria in our intestines turn out to be more important for our nutrition than we once thought. Still not as important as they were for the goat, but more important than we once thought. So a recent study, 2006 in Nature, compared the types of bacteria found in the intestines of obese individuals to the types of bacteria in the intestines of lean individuals. They looked at mice and humans, 
And what they found is obese individuals had different types of bacteria. And those bacteria were better able to break down what would otherwise be undigestible nutrients, things like cellulose. What that means is, is that individuals that are obese are obese at least in part because they're getting more energy out of the same amount of food because the bacteria in their intestines are better at breaking it down. Now, in a lot of the world, obesity is not the issue. It's malnutrition that's the problem. And so a very recent study, just February of this year, did a very similar thing. They looked at the types of bacteria found in malnourished individuals and compared them to their twins who were of normal weight. So this big word, quashiorcor, that's the classic protein malnourishment, that you, the image of starving children with the skinny arms and legs and the big belly. That's quashiorcor. And so they found these pairs of twins where they're presumably eating the same kinds and amounts of food, and yet one of the twins would be of normal weight and the other twin would have quashiorcor. And they looked at the bacteria in their intestines and they found the same kind of differences. That in these twins of normal weight, even though the food was really limiting, they had the same kinds of bacteria that were super good at breaking down these otherwise undigestible nutrients. So the same kind of bacteria that increase your risk of obesity when food is plentiful can make the difference between normal weight and malnourishment in parts of the world where food is really limiting. And this to me is a fascinating example of how microorganisms can be the hidden links in these grand cycles of photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Now, I don't expect that all of you will share my fascination with the role of microbes and energy transfers. And I know that you didn't come here tonight for a biology lecture, however passionately it might have been delivered. <laughs> so I found myself asking a lot over the last few weeks, what is my big idea? What am I trying to get across with my passion for photosynthesis and cellular respiration? And I finally realized that this story is really about the passion. That this was an area where I cared enough to look closely. And the closer I looked, the more rich and fascinating and intricate the connections appeared. And that makes me wonder, what am I missing when I don't care enough to look closely? What are we all missing when we don't care enough to look closely? those passions only.